Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Maple's New York Fall event, our fourth webinar in a series since August, two of which we've hosted on our own and one with Hofstra University on the Long Island manufacturing supply chain, and another with Long Island Association last week on the US MCA agreement. And there's a lot, lot more coming over the next uh, couple of months, which we'll cover later on. But first, let's uh, briefly review our agenda. Uh, after the brief introductions this morning, uh, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, give a bit of a report that is on the Maple Business Council. We'll go to uh, speaker introductions and we'll have a great overview this, uh, this afternoon on the energy interdependence between the United States and Canada from our two guest speakers. And then we'll wrap up with some conversation and uh, open it up to your questions as well. But before we begin a little housekeeping, first, Phones are muted, uh, not because we don't want to hear what you have to say, but uh, since most of us are working from home these days, we want to make sure there's no background noise to uh, get in the way of our uh, conversation today. Uh, we're, we're recording today's event, and a copy will be made available to everybody in a follow-up communication from Maple. And last but not least, as I mentioned, questions will be welcome, and there's a chat box at the uh, bottom of your screen. If you put them in there, we'll make sure we get to as many as possible. So first, let's talk a little bit about uh, Maple's overview in terms of industry coverage. Uh, we cover presently in our membership 20 sectors, and 80% of our members are either directors or more senior executives with their companies. And you can see a scattering here of the industries, quite a diverse group of industries that uh, are represented by our membership. And geographically, it's pretty similar. Maple members are based in 17 U.S. and Canadian markets, and you can see they're pretty well spread out. A little bit more of a preponderance that is in uh, Southern California, because uh, that's where our roots are when we were formed five years ago by our two co-founders, Stephen Armstrong and Robert Kelly. But both U.S. and Canada are quite well represented in our membership mix, with 60% of members based here in the United States, and an additional 40% up in Canada across four provinces. So we have a very diverse uh, community of members bringing insight and value to each other on the opportunity for trade and investment uh, in the US and Canada, and we're growing. I'd like to first uh, welcome two of our exec new executive members uh, from Vancouver, Rian and Chow of global design firm uh, M. Mosier Associates and Ted Lau, founder and CEO of digital design agency, Ballistic Arts. Welcome to Maple, Maple that is, Rihanna and, uh, and Ted. And, and we have two new corporate members since the last time we uh, met. The law firm Dorsey and Whitney has a large Canadian and US practice and is represented in Maple uh, by three partners, led by Sarah Robinson, head of trademark practice based here in New York, and Vancouver-based digital design agency, PowerShifter, whose founder and managing director and head of business development uh, has joined uh, or had, uh, had the corporation sign uh, up with Maple recently. That Power Shifter, by the way, will be one of our feature, featured presenters at the Southern California Winter Reception we're holding on December 3rd. Uh, and I want to just say uh, thank you to both uh, members for, for that. And uh, also, we had some renewing members over the last uh, few months. Uh, one is the uh, Ontario government in Canada that elevated its membership in Maple, uh, and also Toronto-based QA consultants who elevated their membership to our highest level, the gold leaf level. I wanna thank you both very much for making that commitment to our community. Now let's take a look at uh, what's been happening within our organization since the last time we met. Sorry about that. Uh, first, um, we, we announced a new chapter up in Vancouver. We've been growing our Vancouver community since 2016. Uh, we've had two social or SoCal, that is, delegations visit uh, Vancouver. We had a spring and fall reception each year since 2016 and member mixers in that market. The partnership with uh, World Trade Center in Vancouver is particularly interesting and, and a really strong one. And last but not least, Jason C., is our exec, and that is accepted a position as executive director. Jason's been on the ground in Vancouver for us since the beginning, but uh, recently stepped up and took on the role of executive director for our Vancouver chapter. So congratulations, Jason. And we've been providing much more information and content 
We had an interview back in August, as I mentioned earlier, with Hawar Nassim, Acting Consul General of Canada here in New York. Uh, we also uh, have, sorry, we published through Insights, our publication, uh, uh, information on the medical uh, Internet of Things design, uh, Canada US dollar exchange rate issues, uh, workspace design, and uh, we've also been very busy blogging. Uh, we've had uh, multiple blogs on the economic ties between BC and the Cali Southern California markets, uh, the recent uh, Gordie Howe Bridge, International Bridge, which I believe has got 10,000 trucks a day uh, planning crossing that uh, border. Uh, so we're blogging, we're interviewing, we're doing quite a bit of uh, content for our membership in order to keep everybody informed of what's happening in trade between U.S. and Canada. And we've hosted several conversations with members as well. For example, this month we've released two more episodes of our popular Maple Conversations, a video series as we speak uh, with AFEX on Canada-U.S. currency trends during the pandemic and the role of Forex strategies in business planning. Uh, Los Angeles-based AFEX is one of the largest non-bank uh, marketers of foreign currency and global payment systems. And uh, we've also had several webinars, uh, Quebec LA Economic Ties, Canada SoCal Leverage of the USMCA Agreement, Investment and Trade Opportunities in Ontario, and, and on and on. Uh, and we've also uh, had an interview recently with the new uh, Consul General in Vancouver, for the US, Brent Hart, which was very, very interesting. So we've been pretty busy uh, all around uh, the market and in New York here as well. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we hosted a webinar with Hofstra University just two weeks ago on the Long Island manufacturing supply chain. And we also released a supply chain index similar to the ISM index for Long Island only, which is a unique uh, a look at the manufacturing market here in, uh, in Long Island. We also uh, hosted a USS, USMCA agreement, that is, with the Long Island Association just last week, where we had two consul generals and a senior officer from the US Commercial Service join us. So we've been quite busy and, uh, and hopefully you'll, you'll have an opportunity to join uh, our future meetings and webinars as well. So despite the pandemic, I think we're doing a pretty good job uh, of actively de delivering content to our community of members in the US and Canada. So now let's turn to why we're here today. And that is to discuss the energy interdependence between the USA and Canada. The following chart I think perhaps better than most really helps to explain that interdependence. Up in the top left quadrant, you can see 84% of Canadian crude oil production is exported to the United States. So the US as a market for Canadian crude oil is obviously a pretty important one and a highly dependent relationship. And if you look down to the, the right bottom corner, you can see that of all the oil the United States imports, almost half of it originates in Canada. That's a pretty significant dependency as well. So the United States, just in those, that one commodity, have a significant relationship and are highly dependent. If you look just below the natural gas, which we'll hear a little bit about from our speakers today, because they were instrumental in helping to build that relationship, 97% of the natural gas that the U.S. imports comes from Canada. So uh, we're very fortunate today, as I mentioned, to have two of the region's leading executives in the energy and research field to help us understand the importance and the dependencies of this relationship. So let's meet them now. First, we have Robert Cattell, Chairman of the Advanced Energy and Research, I'm sorry, Energy Research and Technology Center at Stony Brook University, and Chairman of the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, John. And David Manning, Director, Stakeholder and Community Relations at Brookhaven National Laboratory former Deputy Minister of Energy in the Alberta government and a past advisor to the Alberta Provincial Government for the United States. Welcome as well, David. Thank you very much, John. So without further ado, let's now hear from our guests on the importance of that relationship, beginning, Bob, with you, if you would. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you again for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, uh, John. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here with my uh, Canadian slash American colleague, uh, David Manny, <laughs> uh, to uh, talk about some of the energy issues 
between the two countries. A little background though, before we get into the specifics on energy, uh, as John mentioned, I currently chair the Advanced Energy Research Technology Center, uh, which is located out at Stern Stony Brook University on Long, Long Island. As you can see, the mission of the Energy Center is to do research and develop the new technologies in the, as I characterize it, the clean energy space, really focusing on uh, renewables and other technologies that are gonna uh, take the energy industry into the future. With a particular focus on commercialization, uh, we have a very uh, great group of people working together with, at the Energy Center. As you can see, some ac other academic institutions, research institutions, energy providers and industrial corporations. The building has been in existence for about uh, 12 years now. It's a platinum LEED certified building, if you're familiar with that designation, which means it's uh, very energy efficient and environmentally sensitive. And one of the keys uh, uh, factors of our uh, ability to do research uh, at the Energy Center is our collaboration with Brookhaven National Laboratories. And I'll now turn it over to my colleague, David Manning, to talk a little bit about uh, Brookhaven National Labs. David? Thank you, Bob. Okay, that looks better. Um, uh, my role is, is basically everything external to the lab, but I think it's very important for this audience to be aware um, of this national lab system, which is really arguably uh, uh, one of the most significant opportunities going forward as we talk about the transition in terms of energy use and energy supply. So these labs are 17 in the U.S. 10 of them are op operated by the Department of Energy. Um, we happen to be the only one in the U.S. Northeast. We're a, a multifunction lab. We do many things. Uh, Princeton is an example just as fusion. But what we do uh, covers a number of energy issues and beyond. So if you look at that slide, you will see in the top corner, it's not that clear, but we are famous for, for our collider. There's only two of these giant ring colliders in the world. One is CERN in Switzerland and the other one is, is here in New York. Um, this is the atom smasher. This is the highest temperatures ever recorded by man. Uh, down in the lower corner is the National Synchrotron Light Source, which is the, one of the newest light sources in the world. There's about 35 in the world. Um, this one happens to be the host of the brightest source of light on the planet. But in addition to these big major machines, which are only available by, you know, with the investment of someone like a federal government to do, um, those support another very interesting other functions. This is the home of the NASA Space Lab, as you can see. So we, we, we're doing a lot of work with SpaceX and other space providers. Um, we have a very significant energy program, which is focused on material science, battery storage, grid level energy storage. Um, we, uh, we were a major isotope supplier and producer. So this is really, as I said, this is the land of the big machines. Uh, and of course, what we're doing here is we are a user facility. So half our work is original research. The other half supports users. Now, a lot of that work has been virtual in the last year, of course, with COVID. But we normally host about 4,000 visiting scientists in a year. Uh, we collaborate with the pharmaceutical industry, with, with corporations, and we have about 35,000 students a year that visit the lab. So workforce development is a key component. So that's my kind of opening salvo there, um, where uh, the national lab system will be very, very significant going forward as the new administration is talking about creating an RPC for climate and kind of research that's going to go into climate science. So John, those are my opening thoughts. Thank you. Okay. Um, John, I'll just continue if you, if, if you don't mind. As you saw, uh, we're still, Canada is still 50% of the oil consumption within the United States, or I should say represents 50% of its imports. The market has changed pretty dramatically, as you know, with recent technology. But I just, I, I put in this historic photo just because I think it's very noteworthy that very significant relationships started in 1947 with loop number one. The Standard Oil Company had drilled 133 dry wells in Alberta. They literally had packed their bags. Everybody had gone home. They'd written off their Western Canadian investment and the geologists convinced them to drill one more time. And that Leduc field opened up this 
phenomenal trading relationship just because there's there's now more oil in Alberta uh, than even just even in Saudi, Saudi Arabia when you take into account the oil sands. Just a tiny note, um, when that well came through just south of Edmonton, Leduc, my father uh, was the young geologist on the adjacent land for mobile oil who drilled a dry hole. So uh, it's uh, near and dear to my heart. And I wound up working in the high Arctic on Canadian rigs when I was uh, in my late teens and early 20s. So, uh, John, I just want to start us there because that amazing trading relationship clearly began with carbon fuels. And Bob will tell you a little bit about the natural gas side of that story. Thank you. Okay, thank you. David, well, just just a little bit of a background on David. As you can see, he has uh, energy in his blood, goes back to his dad. But uh, I first met David in, in Alberta. And interestingly, when I met him, uh, David, you remember the ring you were wearing? I don't know if you still wear your, your peace ring. David actually was at Kyoto. So uh, he's, he's had environmental uh, blood in his genes as well for a long time. But just transitioning a little bit, you saw that first well. Well, that first well developed into a pretty large network of uh, pipelines and electric uh, connections between the US and Canada. So if you look at this map, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail with respect to the map, but uh, you know, touching on, on some of the things that John mentioned earlier, uh, there's a number there, uh, only almost 5 million barrels of oil a day move from Canada into the US. And if you look at the natural gas side, 10.6 billion cubic feet per day, uh, which is about 25% of the natural gas that's used in the lower 48. Now, interestingly, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, we were told in the US, and my background, I was in the natural gas distribution industry. So we were selling natural gas to customers in the marketplace. We were told at that time that we were running out of gas in the lower 48. Well, uh, they also told me that there was some gas up in Western Canada. I honestly have to admit, I wasn't sure I knew where Alberta was. So I got in an airplane and flew up to Alberta. And as the plane was getting ready to land, the pilot came on the, the, the radio and said, it's minus 28 degrees. And I had a nice woman sitting next to me. And I said, is that centigrade or Fahrenheit? And she said, doesn't matter, it's damn cold. And <laughs> there I was with a London fog overcoat with no lining. So that was my first introduction to Western Canada. If you can go to the next slide, John, now this puts it in a little more perspective and shows the actual volume of, uh, of uh, imports coming from Canada into the US. Uh, it's it's uh, you know tailed off a little bit in recent years, but I think that uh, that's gonna continue for a long time in my opinion. That trip to Alberta actually resulted in a number of what we call local gas, dis gas distribution companies collaborating to build the first major pipeline into the, into the U.S. Northeast in over 30 years. That was the Iroquois pipeline. That pipeline went into operation in 1991. Prior to that time, all of the pipelines into the Northeast came from the lower 48, primarily Texas and Louisiana. And by bringing that gas from Western Canada into the New England area, it actually brought the price of gas down by 50%. So it was a new supply, allowed us to grow our markets with a very clean fuel would also provide a significant economic benefit to the, to the Northeast and also significant economic benefit to the, the producers in, in Western Canada. Uh, and again, that's when I first met David, he was working for the Albertan government and uh, I was able to attract him to leave that job in Canada and come to work for us here in the Northeast United States. And, and Bob, I just, I want to point out that that is an important comment on the role of government because the opposition to that pipeline, while some of it was local and, and environmental in nature, um, you know, the usual on the ground issues, there was a tremendous opposition from the U.S. industry. Uh, and they feared that this incursion of natural gas was going to impact their markets. And of course, our argument was but I, I think it's very noteworthy that, that the consulates and, and Alberta, uh, the provinces were very active at that time. The argument was, we're not trying to get a, 
a greater piece of the pie, we're kind of we're trying to create a greater uh, a larger pie. And and that was it's very significant. You may recall the Northeast was the home of oil heat back in that time, uh, which just didn't make any environmental sense. So uh, your work, Bob, in that regard, uh, really had a very significant impact in air quality. Well, thank you, thank you for that. And and that was a, a major factor in growing the natural gas industry at that time in the Northeast United States was to convert uh, to natural gas, which was a cleaner fuel at that time and was very significant to improving the environment. So the connectivity between the US and Canada uh, got even stronger, I guess, David. It's interesting that David mentions that and there's been a lot of trade news in the press here lately, but actually, David, as I'm sure you recall, it was the NAFTA agreement that finally allowed us to get the approval that we needed to get that pipeline built into the U.S. at that time. Well, and, and of course, there's been a lot of press on those trade agreements, and I should be careful because we have trade experts on this call. <laughs> um, but, but I think it's noteworthy that, that NAFTA was actually signed by Ronald Reagan at the tail end of his administration. Uh, and, and Bill Clinton then expanded it uh, to Mexico. Uh, and that was largely at the as the US industry that were very anxious to access that larger market. So um, I obviously have my biases as a, as a dual citizen, but uh, I happen to think that these trade agreements have been very, very helpful uh, and the trading relationship will only continue to grow. I guess just as a bit of an aside, David, I mentioned being uh, being able to attract you to join me in the Northeast and take a job at uh, then Keyspan. The fact that you had married a lovely girl from Long Island, I think had a little something to do with it also. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just put it this way, Bob, I owe you on, on every level. <laughs> okay. John, I, I did have a 3,000 mile commute until you offered me that job. <laughs> so so maybe we'll, we'll start the transition now a little bit, you know, talking about uh, the, the real importance of both oil and gas uh, from Canada in particular coming down to the U.S. and really supporting the development of many of our markets, our economy very much depended on those resources at that time. And I think I could literally say without any exception, without that natural gas supply coming from Canada into the Northeast at the time that it did, we'd be much further behind in some of the environmental improvements that we've been able to make in the past. But now we're moving forward. And the transition is happening from uh, fossil fuels to renewables. As you can see from this slide, New York State in particular has some very aggressive targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, to go to 100% zero emission electricity by 2040, 70% renewable by 2030, 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035, that has to be accompanied by a significant amount of energy storage because the wind does not blow all the time. And also significant solar, uh, which also requires energy storage. And it, if we're able to achieve those, achieve those goals, we're looking at significant reductions in carbon through energy efficiency and electrification as well. So you can see based on this slide, the states that have what are called renewable portfolio standards some of which are mandatory, some of which are more voluntary. There are a few that have no current targets at this time, but I'm sure that will change over time as well. David, you want to pick up on this? Yeah, slide? I think the importance of this slide is to indicate that there are initiatives at the federal level. Um, there are initiatives at the state level, which are significant. Uh, and there are initiatives uh, at the corporate level uh, and the investor community level. So. I don't think any of us would disagree that the energy landscape is in transition. Uh, I think it's noteworthy that the fracking technology, which was broadly used in Alberta, uh, uh, although it was developed within the US, has had a real impact um, in the availability of gas. So that market has been shifting and the availability of gas is much greater in the US, but that has had a very significant impact. So it's noteworthy that the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, Sierra Club, those organizations 10 years ago were funding studies to demonstrate where some of the oldest and least efficient uh, coal plants were located close to or within reach of a gas supply. So now, of course, we're seeing a much greater push to renewables, but it's very interesting that the real headway that has been made 
has been a shifting in the fossil fuels. But I think the point of this slide, Bob, is clear, is that the train has left the station. As you pointed out, I was a delegate to, to uh, Kyoto, and that was over 20 years ago. Um, and so uh, I think now I, we can turn our focus to how this relationship will change in this new world. Thanks, John. So maybe we can move to the next slide. Just to, to uh, expand a little bit on, on the wind uh, uh, and the, the amount of wind that's currently being proposed. This just is a, a slide that shows uh, basically New York. And as you can imagine, a lot of this will come on to Long Island but you can see the amount of offshore wind that they're talking about 2,400 megawatts by 2030, as much as 9,000 megawatts by 2035. And uh, the, the opportunity to develop some of the new technologies to bring down the cost of offshore wind is under the umbrella of the, of the National Offshore Wind Consortium. So why don't we move to the next and, one? Well, actually, if we could stay there for just a moment, Bob, because I think the significance here is, and I think you know, at, I was one of the, I assisted Bob in, in helping land the, the, the grants. The, the Research Development Consortium is co-funded by both the state of New York, NYSERDA, um, and, and the federal government, DOE. But the real goal here is to create a domestic industry so that these parts don't just come over on a barge and get dropped offshore. Um, the real goal is to create a new domestic industry. So I think that's going to be noteworthy for everybody here, that this is really um, you know, in, in its earliest stages. And then the other big piece of that is how you integrate, and Bob, you mentioned this, how you will integrate this level of, of renewable energy into the grid. Because I, Bob and I are both sitting on Long Island, as you see on that chart, during Hurricane Sandy, uh, over 90% of the infrastructure pretty much was impacted, uh, most of it destroyed. And, and so how you land nine gigawatts of interrupted power into our grid and it was designed candidly, the power was moving from Quebec and from Niagara Falls southward. So the big power flow historically has been south, north to south to, to the big, the intensity of the, of the, of the very large uh, market in New York City. Now, of course, the opportunity to move par power in both directions uh, creates more challenges. Thanks, John. And that, of course, brings us to, as I mentioned, um, uh, the opportunity for more hydro from Quebec. The Quebec government, as you know, maintains offices in New York, Boston, DC, um, and, and they have been working uh, alongside the Canadian consulate for some years for this recognition. And, and this is a very significant event in my opinion. Just this past month, um, New York State introduced a new tier. There's a new tier four, which for the first time recognizes uh, uh, hydropower from Canada that can get to this very significant market of New York City um, and those and, and near to tier four creates different ec economics. It shifts the economics in a positive way. Similarly, Massachusetts, which in past lives was very focused on build it here and you know local supply, um, they have shifted. So they're now going to embrace uh, the opportunity to receive Canadian hydropower to the extent of 17% of the state's electricity demand. And I, I think that's being driven by this very, these very, very ambitious goals. And, and you know, this is just me saying, I'm not, I'm not speaking on any, in any capacity other than personal. I just don't know that you can get there from here without Canadian hydropower. One of the nice things about hydropower, David, is the storage is built in. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a very good point. We're, you know, and I, and I should mention that because you saw the 3000 megawatts of storage, you know, have been called for, but, but, and, and I, and I, I will address that, you know, John, you may have a question on that later. Um, but I think grid level storage will be a very, very, very significant um, component of this, but, but God created the best battery in the world. Um, and that, of course, uh, is, is the, uh, the water flows and the rainfall in Northern Quebec. So the beauty of hydropower, sorry about that. The beauty of hydropower is that um, it is not dependent on wind and sun. Uh, it is just a massive battery that you can turn on and off. So arguably the best opportunity to develop more solar and wind and more interruptible is to be backed up by such a very significant source of hydro right. that can balance and run. And, 
And we've seen that in California and even in the UK. California, just in the last two months, has really been struggling during its peak periods because of its, um, its the speed with which it has embraced uh, renewable power. And, and again, I'm not being critical of those decisions in terms of the technology choices. It's the issue of timing, I think, and that as a result, they have suffered some blackouts and some challenges uh, because of their very aggressive stance. So I think our role here at BNL and at Stony Brook um, is to make sure that we, we that, that doesn't happen in New York. And, and I should point out, Bob, that, that, that these national labs are all run, um, operated for the DOE. So I work for Brookhaven Science Associates, which is a joint venture of the Tell Memorial Institute the largest not-for-profit research entity uh, in the world, and Stony Brook University. So uh, Bob and I, many of our leaders here at BNL, our, our top scientists, are also professors at Stony Brook. So that's the connection between BNL and the Advanced Energy Center. Uh, it's very close and strategic. Thanks, John. So John, I think now it would be great if we could open it up to some questions. Exactly. Thank you for leading. Uh... I can get the slide to move on, we could actually see that. <laughs> there we go, okay. Sorry guys, sorry, we got stuck there. By the way, as you were speaking, a question I noticed came in and, and uh, I won't I'll try not to make this a political question, but uh, based on the new administration uh, uh, being led by uh, uh, President-elect Biden, uh, who was part of the administration that was not in favor of fracking and uh, other uh, crude oil coming in from Canada. How do you see that affecting the relationship uh, in the future between the United States and Canada? I'll let, I'll let David, David always handles all my politically related <laughs> questions. <laughs> <laughs> it is a little delicate. I, I do. I am a, a government contractor, as you can appreciate. But uh, let me just make one point. Uh, about about the Keystone Pipeline, which has come up before in these conversations, a lot of the a lot of the strategic benefit of that pipeline, and I speak now as an Albertan, is that the big refineries on the south coast, the uh, the south shore of the U.S., um, they require a lot of heavy oil, and the oil in Texas and the oil in the ground in North Dakota, the Bakken, this these are this is very light oil, and those refineries can only take so much of that, so. The real driver is in, in that, I would argue, is that the oil that those pipelines depend on now is largely coming from Venezuela, some from the Middle East, some from Mexico. Um, and uh, and a, a company like Suncor is 30, 350 environmental scientists on staff. So, so I, I don't want to get into that whole argument, but I think that's the case that those big refineries make, uh, uh, they make asphalt, they make lubricating oils, they make a number of products that depend on this full range of, 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 of input. Um, in terms of this adventure going forward, um, I, I do think that Canada will have a great deal to offer. Um, so I'm thinking about on the technology side, the work that goes on at IRAT, you know, that Hydro-Quebec have got really the only major research uh, Operation Bob left in the utility field in North America. So there's a great deal of work that's gone on, as you know, in Waterloo and, and, and in Ontario. So I think there's a real technology play, but I also do think that there will continue to be that interdependence on carbon fuels. I think it's, I, I've always been a believer and it's all of the above. I, I can't speculate on the timing, but um, I do think that there will be a real focus on energy going forward but I also think that there's a case to be made for the existing relationship. Thank you. Sorry to drop that one on you for as first question, but I might as well get that out of the way and then move on. But, uh, thank you. Yeah, throw on the high hard one first, John. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If I'm not here next week, you can find me at home. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Bob. Let's go back to you. Uh, the, the offshore wind uh, research and development consortium is a big deal here in New York, particularly here in Long Island. But it's also a very important project for the United States, right? It's a, it's a model uh, by which hopefully other states can follow. Uh, and yeah. there's a lot of Canadian participation I think you shared with me uh, not too long ago. Perhaps you can expand a little more on that yeah. relationship and the importance of that overall project. Sure, uh, David David touched on it. The, uh, the consortium 
is a uh, creature, if you want to call it that, uh, created by the Department of Energy and New York State Energy Research Development Authority. But it is a national offshore wind research and development consortium. It happens to be located at the Energy Center on Long Island, but it really has a national focus. And its primary role, its initial role, is to, uh, we have a $40 million fund, 20 from, from DOE and 20 from NYSERDA, to, to fund research, to look at the technologies that are going to improve the long-term cost of offshore wind as it comes into the grid. But as I think David also touched on, the longer-term goal of the consortium is to develop a supply chain. We really don't have a supply chain for offshore wind here in the United States. There's a lot of supply chain in Europe. Some of it will probably come over here. So there's really a, an opportunity, I think, for business development. It's part of our goal. And that business development will be located uh, offshore East Coast, offshore West Coast. Uh, obviously, there, there will be business opportunities for building uh, components of the offshore wind. Whether we'll ever build the, the large turbines here or not, I don't know. But all the other components associated with the offshore wind uh, production, there's an opportunity for production here. Obviously, training of, of individuals to maintain, service the offshore wind. So I think, uh, John, even though our initial focus is on research, a long-term focus is to develop the supply chain and develop the businesses that are needed to support offshore wind. So I think there's tremendous opportunity here in the, offshore, on, in the East Coast, going up into Canada, both East Coast and West Coast. Thank you. And actually, you, you kind of led into my next question. I'm a supply chain guy so and logistics guy. and. Uh, I'm curious, you know, which industry sectors do you think would be the most attractive for this, uh, this type of uh, energy supply and, and how would you deliver it? Okay, well, I think as far as, you know, which sectors, uh, it kind of starts uh, with a lot of the technology that's used for produ produ production of offshore wind is similar in many ways to offshore oil and gas production, the platforms, the things that are necessary so both countries have a lot of experience in offshore uh, drilling and operation of, 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 uh, of oil wells, and some of that can be transferred. But then you get into the whole engineering design, uh, you get into the construction and the maintenance of these facilities, the production of all of the products that are necessary to build the offshore wind. So I think those are the kind of industries, John, that there will be opportunities for. And as far as delivering them, uh, I think there will be opportunities on the education side to train, educate and train the employees of the industry. And then there will obviously be, and this is something you're very familiar with, the logistics of the supply chain of getting those components delivered to the areas that uh, they'll be installed in. And Bob, if I could just pick up on that. Uh, it's very noteworthy. The New York Power Authority is, is the most significant um, what I would say, Crown Corporation. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the state-owned utility of scale uh, in the U.S. Um, and they have just been investing because they are now putting out so much smart grid. There are so many components on the grid. There's so much data coming in that they're struggling to handle that. You add that to the challenge of balancing, and as I said, grid management of interruptible power, and, and they had to reach out for the best computer operations uh, to manage that. And, and where did it come from? Canada. They bought two systems, uh, one out of Manitoba, one out of Quebec. Um, and these are just massive computer banks. Well, they're not massive anymore, of course, with new technology, but they, 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 they're significant. And that was a $10 million investment. So I think with this new administration, what we're hearing and reading is that there's likely going to be a real focus on infrastructure. But it'll be focused on infrastructure, which brings cleaner energy in, a, in, a, in an evolving uh, energy space, but I think there's a whole opportunity for data, for big data, for data management, um, and I think there's real Canadian expertise in that world. So I think it's going to be a combination of some of the engineering and the smart grid technology, which has been developed in Canada. Um, you know, John, one of my favorite examples is LaGuardia Airport. It's astonishing to me that this magnificent new airport is being created and operating at the same time. You'll hear lots of griping about getting in and out, um, but if you've driven by there, it's a startling engineering accomplishment. And of course it's being done largely with Canadian funds and Canadian direction. I don't think people realize the very significant role 
that that Canada is playing in the LaGuardia Airport, and it's because you know Canada adopted a different approach to airports ten years ago. So I think there are opportunities where Canada has really made some progress. Uh, again, I don't work at the consulate or the or the uh, uh, provincial offices, but they have more expertise than I do. That's more current. But I'm just speaking now as an observer that I'm fascinated by the amount of opportunity that Canadians have already taken, and I think that's going to be a driver. But well, now I know why the Canadian, uh, the Air Canada concourse was built first. <laughs> exactly. And I was one of the first guys through, and it's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I thought I was in the wrong airport. It was the weekend. <laughs> well, I'm yeah. point out it was Joe Biden that said this place looks like a third world country. <laughs> it sure did. It sure did. That's, that's really insightful uh, background on that. Yeah, it kind of leads to another question, uh, and it, it can probably pose this to both of you, and whoever wants to jump in, please do. But there's been a long and fruitful relationship between New York and the province of Quebec. In fact, I think the, the Quebec delegation's uh, Delegate General, Catherine Louvier, may be on today, and so she was registered. And if she is, welcome, Catherine. Thank you for joining us. But uh, can you provide some insight to our, our audience today on this relationship and maybe why the governor, Governor Cuomo, has, ma has made this one of his New York's or New York's primary goals to get that power down into New York, hydropower that is. Uh, well, let me, and, let and me just, just, of course, with Canadian hydro. Let me just Sorry. start by uh, David and I both have the honor, David, of service, serving on a committee that works with the Quebec Council and, and we, uh, we are happy to, to be able to, to do that, to kind of maintain the connection even stronger. But I'll start, and, and I think that Governor Cuomo recognizes that to meet his environmental goals, that the hydropower from Canada is gonna be essential. Um, even with all this wind and solar that we're talking about, uh, to get to the goals that he has set out, the very aggressive goals, which are good, I think he recognizes that, and I think David, it seems to me that he's trying to cut through the politics, whatever that means. And some of the politics are local generation in the state of New York that doesn't want to be phased out, that he's recognized. And that's why, as David mentioned, they've created this new tier and are really looking to bring hydropower down from, uh, from Canada. And remember, Bob, the primary <clears throat> driver for the governor has been the closing of Indian Point. Um, that is, he's, he's been committed uh, since he came into office to close Indian Point. Uh, it's a nuclear plant very close to a very, very large financial center and population base. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's an older plant. So the additional challenge of not only um, reducing our CO2 and, and uh, emissions and, and developing a greener economy, but also losing a significant component of our carbon-free generation uh, created that need. Now, hats off to Catherine and to her staff uh, and, to the, and to the Quebec office and the support they get also from the consulate and the work that the Canadian government has done. This has been a long push. I still think that it took a while in part because it was always this idea that there was an opportunity to develop um, uh, these greener sources locally. Uh, but, but I think this is a, a, I think this new tier is a perfect acknowledgement of the fact that, I mean, Bob and I are on Long Island. The highest point on Long Island is a landfill. You know, it's 350, 300 feet high and it's the, it's the Brookhaven landfill. There's not a lot of hydro um, in, in downstate New York. Uh, and there's not a lot of opportunity to develop um, such a stable source of, of green energy. So I just think it's logical, but it has been a big push and hats off. It, it, someone should write a book about that effort. John, we've, John, we've lost you. You're on mute. I'm on mute. I apologize. There he now he's back. <laughs> so, uh, yes. So um, there, we got a question from, uh, from our guest, uh, one of our guests today, saying that this hydro relationship is very important. And uh, while the governor's in support of it, and there may be some resistance, there always is. I heard him speak recently saying no matter what he does, he's going to be sued by 100 people. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, uh, uh, he's been uh, pretty aggressive on building infrastructure, and I think uh, he'll probably get it done it with support. But how does how do you see the U.S. and Canada working more closely to become more competitive 
uh, in this in this area versus the rest of the world. I, 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 right, go ahead, I'll start. Yeah, I, John, I think you've hit the magic word. Uh, in my view, um, is it's we have to be competitive as an economy, and we have to be a competitive as we have to be competitive as a region as well as as a nation. Um, and and to be competitive in this new economy, the cost of these energy sources is coming down, but it's coming down through innovation and scale, admittedly. But but that's why I think that, that you know, that's why I keep bringing in data because Canada has real strength in that area. Um, the hydropower issues, of course, will always be there. Um, uh, Canada has... Uh, I think done a good job. I, I happen to be an honorary member of Canada's First Nations. You can't see it over my shoulder, but I have a, a I have an eagle feather on. They don't give you a certificate; they give you an eagle feather because when that happened, um, it was it was at that time because of their uh, their numbers. It was illegal to own, to possess an eagle feather unless you were a member of First Nations, and that came from the Premier of British Columbia and I when I was leading the oil and gas. Uh, uh, cap. Um, we were recognized by First Nations peoples for the work that we did to create the Muskoka National Park. So I think there's a real opportunity there. I think I think some of the issues that have been raised, I don't think are current. Uh, Matthew Kuncombe did an amazing job and built a tremendous career, uh, driving a better understanding. And I think Hydro Quebec have done a very good job. So so I I think. Going forward, we have a real opportunity to embrace uh, 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 an international uh, uh, con, um, conciliation uh, where we get by some of these issues. I know in the, in the heat of, of campaigns, we talk a lot about Buy America, uh, but I also think that there's a higher calling and the higher calling is to create a competitive environment. Yeah, the only thing, the only thing I'll add to that is uh, I think the, the, the uh, the ability to continue to do research. Uh, David used the word innovation, technology. I think that's our future. I think the two countries have really good opportunities. Hydro-Quebec has a magnificent research facility uh, outside of Montreal, which I've had the pleasure of visiting uh, with David. So I think that's a, a big part of it. It's gonna come down to cost. It's gonna come down to reliability, but I think research and innovation are gonna be key. And I think there's a great opportunity for the two countries to collaborate on that, John. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit and go to Brookhaven National Labs. Um, one yes. of my favorite places, uh, not only <laughs> here on Long Island, but almost anywhere. It's an amazing facility. And, and for anybody that's interested who's listening, you can take a tour, I think, in the summer uh, with your kids there and see this uh, Eon Collider and, and other uh, cool things they're doing there. So I'd take advantage of it if I were you. But Bob, uh, David, I mean, uh, you have some renowned scientists working there on, on battery research, right? Trying to design uh, the type of batteries that can power cars and, and uh, industry. Maybe you can give us a little bit of insight into the type of people that are working on that and, uh, and the research they're conducting. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And, and in the previous slide, you don't need to go back, but because um, I think these, these will be available, is Esther Takeuchi uh, receiving um, her medal from uh, then President Barack Obama. Um, Esther has literally saved um, hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, some of us of a certain age, not me, but you can have an implanted defibrillator and it literally rides around attached to your heart, monitoring things. And it can be in there for 10 years, keeping track of pace. And then of course, if all of a sudden the heart stops, it delivers a jolt, just like the paddles, a million times the power of a pacemaker. Esther Takeuchi invented that battery and has 24 patents on that battery as she has continued to improve it. And Esther divides her time between Stony Brook University and BNL and heads our battery program. Now her focus now is replacing lithium. She's looking for a substance which is more readily available because of course lithium is a uh, is a non-renewable resource and it's in two or three specific areas of the world. Um, she also is looking for a more stable substance. Frankly, her focus is now on rust, but, but she's also uh, working on fast charging, which of course we can all understand given the transportation sector. And then finally, she's spending a lot of time 
on recycling or renewal of batteries, because we're going to have an awful lot of, 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 of batteries in use here. We have a lot of batteries in use now. And so she's taking them apart, baking the inners and putting them back together and, and, and making some real progress. So that's, I think, one of the real areas of innovation, because she's not focused on the transportation sector, per se, of trying to get everything smaller. She doesn't care about size. She's trying to make things longer duration, higher capacity. She's really more focused on the grid. And we're going to need that kind of help on the grid if we have this tremendous growth that we're anticipating. The, the IEA just came out with a report of renewables just yesterday, and, and the, the numbers are just staggering, the speed with which this is increasing. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, Catherine just dropped a, a note uh, to me here. Catherine Lubier, that is Delegate General uh, for uh, Quebec in New York, saying that their goal is to become the, quote, battery for New York. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Great comment. <laughs> very witty. Yeah, very witty. Uh, let's move on a little bit to both of you, perhaps. Maybe you both can comment on this. But keeping in mind that our members uh, span, as I said earlier, over 20 industry sectors and geographically are all throughout North America here. Uh, what advice would you have for anyone interested in doing business in this renewable sustainable energy sector? Bob, you wanna go first? Yeah, well, I think, I think uh, what, I, what I would do is, is kind of look, look at the various segments, you know, and, and look at what kind of value you can bring to, to the particular segment. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about solar and we've, well, we haven't talked a lot about solar. We've talked a lot more about wind probably and batteries, but there's solar technologies. All of these businesses and talking about energy now are gonna re require uh, components to be manufactured somewhere to, to make them work and put them together. So whether it be solar panels, whether it be components of wind, I think the companies have to look at what expertise they have in the particular areas, look at their competitive position, obviously, and then reach out to the companies that are in the sector. On the National uh, Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium, on our board, we have the uh, large developers of offshore wind, the Orsteds of this world, the, the Shells. I think those could be potential customers for the services uh, that those companies could provide. And if I could just add to that, I think there'll be a real focus, as I said earlier, on, on infrastructure. So infrastructure, which brings us to uh, a cleaner energy economy. So I think there will be some focus and money in that world. I mentioned earlier the data that I think big data will be very, very significant because I don't see how we can have this ongoing rush to new energy supply and manage it without a much better understanding of the, of the data flows that are required. Um, I do want to just mention, John, for just give me 30 seconds to plug uh, b and uh, The, the uh, U.S. government um, has just announced the, an electron ion collider. So this will be the first in the world. But this is up to $2.5 billion of investment. Um, Empire State Development, New York State, uh, is putting in $100 million worth of infrastructure to, to accommodate this. So there's a phenomenal focus. I showed you those giant rings where we collide ions. Well, now we're going to combine ions and electrons. And the reason is that by combining smashing ions together, we get to look at quarks and gluons, which don't appear to have any mass, but make up all uh, the mass of all visible matter. So an EIC is going to give a better understanding of that. So there's real investment going on in science today. And I think Canada has a role to play there as well. There's when you think about some of the performance of some of the universities, what's going on in Vancouver, what's going on in Waterloo over the years, uh, I, I'm, I'm very encouraged that there's um, that the world's challenges are going to be addressed with science. Well, thank you, thank you both. I don't think many people realize uh, how invested or realize before this session, New York is and has been in in this whole energy and sustainable uh, renewable energy market. So I really appreciate the insight. I know we could have talked another hour with the history of this, uh, this, whole, uh, this whole sector for New York, but maybe we can have you back again and we can, uh, we can continue the conversation. But I wanna thank you again for a terrific, terrific overview today. Uh, and I hope you join us again. John, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure.
Thank, Thank you, you. Marcia. Before, really before we end today's session, if we could, I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit about what's upcoming for Maple over the next uh, month or so, if I can get my screen to cooperate. Uh-oh, it's not cooperating. <laughs> ah, there we go. There you go. Okay. So uh, we're partnering uh, uh, this month, actually, up in Boston with the Canadian Entrepreneurs of New England Association uh, on a forum, uh, and uh, we're a supporter of that organization. It's a life sciences uh, forum, and uh, you may want to look that up uh, and uh, see if it's something you'd be interested in attending as well. Also, we're, uh, we're uh, partnering on investment opportunities in Vancouver with Deloitte, Faskin, uh, one of our members, and, and the Vancouver Economic uh, Commission. If you want to know more about these and other events coming up, visit our community events page at maplecouncil.org. Um, the most important slide here is we'd love you to become a member of Maple, uh, where the we feel anyway, where the we cover Canada US economic ties like no other business association or community. And it's something unique to the market. So if you have an interest in trade with Canada and the relationship, uh, business relationship between Canada and the United States, Maple would be a good place to be. Joining Maple in New York also brings a Canada US ex executive network to you. You don't have to travel to hear from Canadian executives, or if you're in Canada, as many of the participants are here today, you don't have to travel here to hear from two experts like Bob and David on uh, the energy uh, market here. Uh, you can network, share insights through our content and our platforms, and stay abreast of key news affecting that trade relationship. We're also proud to partner closely with the Consul Gener Generals of Canada, the US Commercial Service, and the economic development agencies and other stakeholders like the Quebec delegation here in New York. So we'd love to have you as a member. And if you'd like more information on how to become a member and bring all of that to your organization, please contact me at john at maplecouncil.org. I'd be happy to uh, have a discussion about the benefits. With that, we wanna say thank you again to Bob and David for a great overview and conversation today. I wanna thank each of you for your time. And it looks like we're ending today's session exactly on time. If we didn't get to your questions, I promise we'll follow up uh, after, the, uh, after the webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you all. Thanks for your interest. Have a great day. <laughs>